You're listening to Chicago Stories, a podcast from City Hall featuring the stories of everyday Chicagoans, as told to Mayor Rahm Emanuel. This is Mayor Rahm Emanuel for Chicago Stories. We have Coach Troy, uh, the coach for Phillips Academy football team, two-time state champion. Uh, Troy was just nominated, and you will receive the Gatorade Award at the ESPY Award Ceremony, if I got that right. Yeah. yeah it's is it, a, how's it called? Gatorade? It's the Gatorade Coaching Excellence Award. Only two people get it in the United States. It's yeah, for high so school one coaching. female, one male. Uh, covers all sports. So on uh, there's kind of two events associated with it. The first one is uh, the Gatorade actual where the award is presented. And then the next night, a part of the award is uh, I get to go to the ESPYs. Well, that's great. Yeah. Did you ever think when you were like, I'm going to be a coach and this is what my, is that wasn't a goal, I assume, or was it? Uh, I think as I got into high school and, and started playing more and more sports and, and enjoyed being around sports, I knew I wanted my career to be associated with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think coaching is one of those avenues. And, you know, when you start coaching, you're, you're not doing it to to receive accolades. It's more to, to give back um, mm-hmm. and, and kind of take the lessons you learned as a young man and, and give them uh, to other, you know, young men growing up. Uh, but this is a pretty cool award and, and going to hopefully be a great experience. It'll be great. Phillips Academy, Bronzeville. Mm-hmm. You took a team from our first season, two and seven. Six years later, you win the first time ever for a Chicago Public School statewide football championship. Two years after that, we win again twice in three years. And uh, while you're also uh, building the football team, the academic standards of Phillips, which at so one point they were thinking of shutting, mm-hmm. uh, working with uh, our AUSL, we turned it around, and now it's a place kids are going to rather than not and acad- and the sports and the high academic standards were part of that yeah so it went in july of 2010 um, when AUSL turned around the school I, I came in as part of the initial mm-hmm. staff um, and we've we've made progress yeah. and it was slow to start even with our football program but then over time it's all kind of coincided together as our schools improved academically um, and our attendance rates have shot up uh, our and football, your college. Yeah, and our college acceptance and scholarship, everything is, has shot up, so has our, our football program. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think in every principal we've had since I've been there, um, and even now with Mr. Sullivan, we always talk about the football team sets the tone because we actually play two games before school starts. Mm-hmm. So like those first couple of games are big on, hey, let's get some wins, let's mm-hmm. get you know the positive vibes rolling so when school starts and the kids come in the building, we're, we're ready to roll. Your first statewide team, had like seven homeless mm-hmm. kids on a squad of 50, if I'm not, or 54, if I'm not, if I, my memory serves me right. And you talked about building a sense of family. These kids were going literally from your place to some of their classmates. Is that, share a little about how that, yeah, I, how that made, I think you, at the auditorium, you talked about how that brought you all together as a family, not just a team. Yeah, I think, I mean, every young man or every young person wants, wants to belong. Um, mm-hmm. And, part of what we've created is a place where where everybody belongs. Mm-hmm. And one of the great things about football is no matter your shape or size, um, there's a place for you. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not like other sports where you have to fit a certain mold. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that part of the sport and that part of the culture we've created in our program has allowed everybody to have a, a place to belong. And, and for the kids who are the young men that have more difficult home lives, um, you know, they've got teammates that they can count on. Um, mm-hmm. And if they need a place to stay or they need some food, um, but just whatever they need, they have they can count on each other. Um, mm-hmm. And obviously that's the family component. Uh, and look, we don't always get along, which any family. Welcome to family, man. Yeah, and, and that's our approach. But at the end of the day, I mean, that's, we do. That's a definition of family. We love each other and, and I'm not afraid to tell a young man that I love him. Um, mm-hmm. And they're not afraid to say it back because they understand what that word means. Um, and we're not using it lightly, but we're saying it in a way of respect and care and, and to know like, hey, we've got each other, we just always have to be there. What's the one thing you want people to know that uh, don't know about you or don't know about Phillips? That when you get out there and you get this award, uh, I have my own vision, not just for this, but how I want people to see our kids, not by stereotypes, but by who they are. But what's your goal? I think part of it is is we're, we're breaking down barriers and the stereotypes that people have, um, mm-hmm. we're kind of pushing through those. And, and I say this, like, our doors are open. You know, mm-hmm. we don't hide anything. It's, you can come in and that's one of our big push with parents. It's like, hey, come mm-hmm. have a look. You know, don't, 
don't come in at five o'clock to meet with somebody. Mm -hmm. um, come during the day so you can see us in action and, and see how things are being dealt with. We have our issues. We're a neighborhood school. Mm -hmm. But we deal with them correctly. Um, and overall, I mean, you can go into classrooms and you see education occurring. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a big plus. Uh, and I think part of that is the structure we have provided through AUSL. Um, and obviously a great administration and great faculty at the school. Did you pick, uh, I mean, I know you went to Dulles, mm -hmm. which is also an AUSL. And for everybody that doesn't know, AUSL is a turnaround school model. Keep the kids, get rid of the adults who aren't working, and then make sure you have a fresh start. Were you always thinking of that, or is that I've just a, like by accident? I've had a unique experience uh, in CPS. Uh, I was at Dulles before AUSL took it over, so I was actually I, let go um, and not retained as part of uh, when AUSL took it over. Um, and through a long roundabout way, ended up back with AUSL. And I think part of it was when I was let go at Dulles that they had my name, I hope, on a, on a short list. So when things occurred later on, um, two years later, mm -hmm. opportunity presented itself. So one of the things I, you know, we've had uh, Kamal Murray who opened up Excess Tennis on the south side in Washington mm -hmm. Park. Uh, we've also had uh, Coach Moser from uh, Loyola. Mm -hmm. What drew you to coaching? I mean, I mean, there's a certain quality uh, that takes to be a coach, especially high school sports, and why football? Growing up, other than my father, um, my high school football coach probably had the most significant impact on my life. Mm -hmm. um, and just in terms of, of, you know, becoming a man and, and what it is to be a, a husband and, and father. Um, and, and I think his approach really set with me or sat mm -hmm. with me. And, and as I went to college and, and was kind of finding my way, I think I knew coaching. I always had a, a connection there. Mm -hmm. Um, and for whatever reason, I always felt I had some leadership skills about me uh, and, and just when given the opportunity, made the most of it. I mean, to take a team, I think before you walked in was two and seven. So our first year we were two and seven. Okay. Um, and our first practice was 12 players. The, the biggest part of that was just trying to, to figure out who wanted to be a part of the program. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think before it was kind of just whoever showed up played. Mm -hmm. And then we tried to kind of make expectations where, no, you got to be there every day to play. Mm -hmm. uh, and then each year, uh, we don't really have a, a set of team rules. I think one of the first things I ever did was look at um, a team rule book um, from a team, actually another team in Illinois. And it was like 115 rules they had to be a member of the team of what you had to follow. And I was like, I can't do this. I won't have a single player. Right. So I kind of went away, like, what do I need to have? And from my teaching background is just, you know, expectations. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't have to be rules. It can be expectations. So this is what you're expecting to happen. And as we, we put that in place, it, it kind of changed the whole mindset and our approach. And then kind of each year we've upped the expectations a little bit more. Uh, and obviously our success has kind of coincided with some of that. Well, I suppose one metric. How many kids show up now for uh, being part of, You went from 12 to... This past year, we were just over 100. That's a slight inflationary number. Yeah, <laughs> and, and I think if you look at our, our school, we're right. right around 600 students, so approximately 300 boys. Um, we've got one-third of them playing football. And you said, I, I read somewhere, that uh, the young men taught you more let me get the exact quote so I don't put words. Taught me more about life in five years than you've learned your whole life. Is that, that's your quote? I, I think when you see, I'm from a small town right. in Canada, um, you know, and, and a, a two parent stable home. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we didn't have everything we wanted, but life was good. Right. Uh, and just, just to see the daily struggle of some of the young men and, and what mm -hmm. they overcome. And, and I ask a lot of them and I I refuse to, ask for anything less. I mean, I want the most, I want it all. Right. Uh, Cause that's what's gonna help them later on in life. And, and they've got to understand at some point that, you know, nobody, nobody's gonna care. You have to care, you have to be the one to overcome. And, and if I don't hold them accountable, if I don't push them, um, it's gonna set them back. Tell me I, uh, two moments in time. One, you go from a win to going down state, but don't make it, come back a third year win. What was that middle year? Uh, and what was the feeling and how did you feel going off the high of, not that that's the only comparison, but how did you, what was the lesson there? If there was a lesson or how, what did you personally There's, take away and what did the kids take away? We, we definitely had, I mean, for lack of a better word, a hangover effect, um, in 2016, 
I from think, the win, you mean? From the win. Yeah. yeah. So we won in 15. Wide. In 16, we, we made it back to the semifinals and lost in overtime. Um, and it was just one of those devastating losses in a group of young seniors who had experienced nothing really but winning. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and it was tough to see and, and the devastation on their part. Uh, but throughout that year, there were some signs that all right, this group's not the same. Uh, we actually brought in former Navy SEALs to do some training with some like leadership type right. training. And uh, we had two of our veteran leaders that no showed uh, the morning of one of the trainings. It was a it was a five o'clock morning session with them and they no showed and they're just like, oh, I couldn't make it. Do it. And right then, and that was in the winter of, you know, would have been 16? early 16. And I knew then like uh, this group just doesn't have that desire that hunger um, and that's what separates us you know mm-hmm. the, what what our young men deal with on a daily basis when they're in a football game it's it's easy you know it's it's not the struggle because their struggles at home for some of them so mm-hmm. when they're on the football field no, it, they, they grind through yeah. yeah um so you knew then that we're in trouble uh, me personally i just had that vibe and and uh you know after that loss that next off last off season you could just see the hunger was back Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then I think this year with having 20 seniors on the team, there's a group of young guys that 20 have, of them, the other players. Yeah. And this year we got a group coming back that we know we're going to be inexperienced in different spots, but the young guys are hungry because yeah, they were on the team, but they weren't key contributors. Right. And this is going to be their chance to be key contributors. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and right now, you know, we've got five underclassmen that have division one offers at the moment. So those really? young men, yeah, they want to you know, really push forward so they leave their legacy at the school. Where's the 20, I mean, I'm not going to go through all of it. Where are the, I mean, where are they going to school? So we've got a um, young man at the, the Division One. We had, right. we had four Division One players this year. One's going to NIU. Mm-hmm. Uh, another young man, Terrence Taylor, is going to Toledo. Mm-hmm. Um, our quarterback's going to, to South Dakota State, and our running back's going to Kent State. Mm. So they're they're definitely, you know, going across the country. We've got... More and more each year, it's like you get kids from the, the East where, Coast. Where was it 2012? 2012? Yeah. Uh, the, we're going too many places. We're going. Um, but, you know, as we've as we started winning and having more success on the field, um, I think more and more colleges started to take notice. Recruit. Yeah. Um, so over the past four years, we've had 13 Division One players. Wow. Um, and like I've said, we have five underclassmen with Division One. We have a freshman that has multiple Division One offers. You got to right a freshman? Yeah. So Dominic Bass is a defensive lineman. Actually, came from Deneen Elementary, right. which is another AUSL school. Right. Um, he's got an offer from Michigan, Michigan State, Florida, uh, Auburn, Ole Miss, uh, kind of all over the place. A freshman? Yeah. Do we have to call the NCAA? Is that legal? <laughs> I mean, they, really? They can't talk with him, but they can talk to me to talk to him. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely a, an eye. Is that opening. a first for you? It is. You know, this past year we had a sophomore during the season receive an offer, and that's the earliest we've ever had a young man receive a scholarship offer. Um, and then as this off season started, and now Dominic started for us this year um, and played a big part of what we did. He blocked a punt in the state championship game. Um, but as his what was that score? Thirty-three to seven. Um, so it was it was a you just was, couldn't give him three points. You just had to stuff him, right? Yeah. So we uh, we had a we had a good game. Um, yeah. 33 to 7, I would say, is a yeah, good game. Yeah, we had a good quick start, which kind of allowed us, when we were struggling in the game, we had a, a nice lead. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, the, the recruiting process is a monster, um, and it's it's difficult because it's hard on the young men, and mm-hmm. they want earlier commitments, and they want them to verbal, and, and you know these guys are just trying to, to figure yeah. out what they want to do with their future. Coach Moser said something to the effect that uh, – like they were playing, having a great game, and then all of a sudden there was a seven-minute stretch, five-minute stretch. That it, you know, games move in. Um, there's just windows, and those windows are make or break. And you said you guys had a lead, and then you were struggling. Do you buy that same thing that you can have a great game, and all of a sudden there can be a six-minute stretch? You know, I, everybody will call it momentum, right? But I just think there's time, and especially in high school, more so than college. They're 16 and 17 years old. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes we forget that they they start looking. You know, you're winning twenty one nothing in the state championship game. Mm-hmm. Your mind starts to wander of like, <laughs> oh, I can't wait for the end of the game. You know, it's going to be a party, and then all of a sudden the team, you know, smacks you in the mouth and they score a touchdown and everybody's looking around each other like, who's going to do it? And then for us, what happened? It was just sticking to our game plan and what 
what we've done all year long mm-hmm. and, and it was just taking care of the fundamentals, the small things. Um, so even though, and you know, we might not have moved the ball offensively, mm-hmm. you know, our punt team, we, we got a great punt. So then it flipped the field, you know, and then the defense just gets a stop or the defense got a turnover and Hey, now we're, we're back on the level wind ground. is back in the sails rather than yeah. the face. Yeah. And, and it was just taking care of the small stuff. And I think on the collegiate level, um, it's, Maybe even more so because the the, the stretches can become mm-hmm. longer and longer. At high school, most of the time, it's just a lack of focus because they're 16 and 17 years old, and it's hard to keep that focus the whole time. Tell me how you uh, keep the kids' uh, grindstone, uh, their nose to the grindstone on academics, so they can balance both the uh, sports side with the student side. For sure. Obviously, I mean, if they have an F, they're not playing. Right. So that right there um, makes it difficult because they have to really push themselves mm-hmm. uh, and. It used to be a lot. Obviously, there is the coach accountability because, you know, we our athletic, athletic department is getting the grade checks done and, and making sure that occurs. But I think the biggest part is peer accountability. Um, and our first two to three years in our program, we didn't have that. Mm-hmm. Um, kids weren't holding each other accountable. Mm-hmm. And as we've progressed, it's kind of become less and less about coach accountability. So me holding the kid accountable and more about, hey, the, the other players holding each other. And that means more, so much more when you've got a senior captain <clears throat> or someone else who's a leader on the team going to a younger player and saying, like, hey, you've got to get it together. Mm-hmm. We need you on Friday night. Uh, we're counting on you. Then it is a coach because that's your peer looking you in the eye and saying that. Uh, no messing around here. And I think the peer accountability piece is what, uh, what kind of separates us. And mm-hmm. I think a lot of programs don't have that, which is why there's more and more struggle sometimes. It's interesting how Chicago, I just met, a, so I was down in today, uh, Pullman. We're opening up a youth center there, and uh, the young man is the pitcher, senior for uh, the school Brooks, Gwendolyn Brooks. He's going on full ride University of Minnesota mm-hmm. pitching, and it is interesting. I was talking to him, and he was talking about um, team camaraderie, and somebody started, you know, his mother and father were both there, but really mentoring him and helping him along and creating that camaraderie that you can't replace anywhere else when it comes to a team. Yeah. So, so, Troy, let me ask you a question. You're growing up in, in Canada, mm-hmm. one of the small town. Did you ever see yourself as a uh, coach of a statewide f- football team? Uh, you know, hockey was big back home. Yeah, I, uh, that's why I threw the Canada thing as a subtle yeah. subtext. So, you know, I, I played a lot of hockey growing up, and then as I got into high school, got into football, mm-hmm. um, and, and developed a, a unique passion for it. Uh, and then... You know, as I went to college and played football, Canadian college football, and, and coached actually there for th- at Queen's University for three years. Um, and then it was just, all right, this is what I want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and trying to figure out a way to, to do that. And obviously, you know, being a teacher and, and a high school coach is... Uh, what do you teach? I teach PE. Yeah, so doing that is, is a great way to, to be involved, like I said, with sports mm-hmm. um, and give back to the community. Do you see um, the whole effort on uh integrating sports better into um the academics and the you know you're you teach pe but i mean trying to create that for our children that they understand that it's sports is not one thing you have to actually your mind and your body you have to be developed together i mean it it's it's a a different mindset in the sense like i i went to school i love to play sports Mm -hmm. and i knew i had to do school to play sports Mm -hmm. Um, and I think a lot of young men in our program have that same mentality and mm. that's okay because you're doing school, mm. um, whatever your reason is for doing school, y- you've got to go with that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think to go to NCAA schools and, and play, mm-hmm. whether it's football, basketball, whatever sport you have to qualify. So you can't just be a player. Um, the, the, the dumb jock, mm-hmm. so to speak, and go to school and play. You have to actually maintain a, a higher GPA and get a test score. That's what do you make of the rap on football right now in the sense of head injuries? What do you, uh, I think as, as we're moving forward, right. there'll be more and more, um, coach accountability. And what I mean by that is more certification mm-hmm. that's required. I think, um, safe practice habits are key. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't practice in full pads ever because if we do, they're going to, the boys will try to smack each other. Right. Um, it's just the nature of the game and, and sometimes young men. So we control all we do in practice. We have a very quick whistle. Um, a lot of our tackling drills we actually do with, with the shadow man dummies, um, which is just a, right. basically a blow up doll that you move back and forth and they tackle it. Uh, and that's just to prevent the number of hits that are occurring. Um, I think if, if football is controlled properly in practice, 
um, and with rule changes in the game, um, it's it's a it's a sport that parents can put their their children in and feel comfortable. Uh, I think a lot of times what was happening was just because of bad habits. Um, I played soccer, man, and you, the amount of ball banging on your head. Yep, you give which me is a, why it's banned in many youth sports. Heading. Yeah, uh, we have a fast round here. It's kind of the, it's my own personal fast round, and I know you're from Canada, so we're gonna give you a little slack here. Okay. All right, ready? <laughs> Cubs or Sox? <sighs> it can't Blue be that. Jays. No. Okay, that doesn't count. Cubs <laughs> or Sox? We're gonna practice this one more time. Uh, I work at Phillips, which is half a mile from the Sox Stadium, so Sox. Okay. Thick or thin pizza? Gosh. Okay. You can't, Coach. Come on, man. It's, I know it's gotta be quick. Uh, thick. You sure? Yeah. Okay. River or lake? Lake. Sears or Hancock? CN Tower. Okay, I'm gonna give you a redo on this one. You're really like you're letting me. You're letting all the Canada. Uh, Sears. Troy, yeah, Trudeau's really upset with you. Okay. Yeah. Twelve inch or sixteen inch softball? Twelve inch. Okay. Uh, I'm Troy McAllister. It's great to have you here on Chicago Stories. I really want to thank you for investing in our kids. Thank you for having me on, and, and uh, appreciate you taking the time. All right, man. Phillips, we're going to see you next year, state. That's the plan. All right, brother. Let's go. (laughs) You've been listening to Chicago Stories with Mayor Rahm Emanuel. You can subscribe and leave a review on Apple Podcasts and tweet your guest ideas using hashtag ShyStories. Thanks for listening.